Well, it's a great pleasure to be here with you today, uh, Dr. Ketty. And before we start uh, going over some of the highlights of your contributions, which are quite uh, uh, a long list of things that we can talk about, I'd just briefly like to mention a few things about you know, where you've been. And uh, you apparently graduated from uh, University of Pennsylvania. Uh, your, your life is broken up into three periods, starting in Pennsylvania and then coming to NIH and then uh, going away um, to Boston. And for a while, you also were at Harvard for, at uh, Johns Hopkins, and, uh, and then coming back again to NIH and, and Bethesda. Uh, you've had, of course, all kinds of awards and honors. The National Academy of Sciences has honored you. Uh, the Tokyo has honored you with the Hiroshi uh, uh, Nihara Award. The National Academy of Sciences Award in Neurosciences is the most latest one, I think, in 88. Uh, you've been a uh, professor at Hopkins as well as at Harvard. And your <clears throat> life, in a sense, has gone from basic science uh, with applications to uh, clinical science, primarily in psychiatry and neurology. But of course, a lot of the work is very relevant to neurosurgery as well. Uh, over 280 publications when I counted them the last time. <laughs> I'd, um, when I looked over the, the your bibliography, what I found uh, interesting was that uh, it was about 1940, I think, uh, around there, 45, when your two papers came out, both in the same year, which were the first papers with, uh, with Dr. Schmidt and then your paper on the uh, measurement of the gaseous metabolism of the brain, first in animals and also and then in humans. Um, that essentially were the, the foundation stones, I think you would agree, and you built on, on that in terms of its uh, ramifications, applications. How did you get to that kind of interest and how did this all begin? Um. I had a National Research Council fellowship uh, after I finished my internship uh, <clears throat> uh, to work with Dr. Joseph Aub in Boston. The reason for that was that I had an interest in lead poisoning and as a medical student I had, I had done some work which uh, led to the development of the treatment of lead poisoning with citrate iron <clears throat> uh, which was supplanted by better chelating agents. But at that time, I was interested in lead poisoning. And, I, and so I won this fellowship, went to Dr. Aub. And <clears throat> Dr. Aub was not working on lead poisoning at that time, but he was working on shock. And, uh, and, and so we worked on shock. As a matter of fact, I think after I got there, Pearl Harbor took place. And, uh, and then, then, then the, the whole laboratory turned intensively to work on shock. Yeah. And so I became interested in the circulatory reflexes and the homeostasis uh, that uh, permitted the brain to receive its blood flow even with a uh, drop in, in cardiac output. And in Boston, I heard a wonderful lecture by Andre Kurnan on the measurement of cardiac output in human beings uh, using the Fick principle. And that was going to stand me in great stead later. While I was in Boston, I read a paper by Schmidt and Dumke, or Dumke and Schmidt, on the measurement of cerebral circulation in monkeys using a bubble flow meter. And I thought that was a very clever technique and a wonderful device, and we knew that the cerebral circulation was very important. So that when I finished my, my fellowship in Boston, although Dr. Aub suggested that I might stay there. I, I, I returned to Philadelphia uh, and uh, uh, asked Dr. Schmidt if I could work in his laboratory. Dr. Schmidt had been one of my teachers at the University of Pennsylvania. And so I, I began working with Dr. Schmidt using the bubble flow meter and, and assisted him in his studies on the oxygen consumption uh, of the brain in in uh, convulsions, in anesthesia, and so on. But I was constantly uh, challenged by the idea that although it was interesting to measure these functions in animals, how much more exciting it would be to be able to measure them in human beings, because the human brain is so much different from the animal brain. It suffers from disorders that the animal brain cannot mimic. and. Uh, and so I, I began thinking about how one might get an approach to the human brain 
uh, indirectly, of course, one couldn't, one couldn't insert a bubble flow meter there. And I remembered Dr. Cornon's uh, 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 talk and his wonderful work, which stimulated me uh, to, the, to the idea that it was possible to measure these functions indirectly uh, uh, rather than directly. And, uh, and so it didn't take long before I realized that the Fick principle would be an important way of getting at the circulation in the brain, except that one couldn't measure the oxygen consumption uh, of the brain because that is what one needed to apply the Fick principle. One could get the AV difference, but not the oxygen consumption. And then the thought occurred that if one used an inert gas instead of oxygen, then the amount of inert gas that was taken up by the brain would not be dependent on whether the brain was thinking or convulsing. It would be dependent simply upon the volume of the brain, the capacity for the inert gas, and diffusion constants, things, physical things that would not be influenced by the functional activity of the brain. And so I decided to use nitrous oxide, which had been used by earlier uh, workers as an inert gas for physiological measurement. And uh, lo and behold, the prediction worked out. We could measure the arteriovenous nitrous oxide difference instead of the oxygen difference by putting a needle in into the internal jugular at its superior bulb, the way the psychiatrist Meyerson had done mm -hmm. in Boston several years before that. And, uh, and give it, then getting the arteriovenous difference uh, we then needed to know how much inert gas was taken up. Well, if we had used the radioactive gas, we could have measured that on the outside of the brain by, by a Geiger counter. But nitrous oxide was not a radioactive gas uh, until it, it uh, occurred to me that at some point the brain will come to equilibrium with the blood that, that, that's going through it in terms of nitrous oxide partial pressure. And at that point, the venous blood which leaves the brain would have the same partial pressure as that. So using the venous blood again and the arterial venous differences and waiting 10 minutes for equilibrium to take place permitted one to apply the, 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 the Frick principle. And that, that led then to the nitrous oxide technique for measuring the cerebral blood flow. And of course the argument uh, for those who haven't read the papers is uh that by measuring the inert gas, you can then find out, you can infer the uh, metabolic activities well, by the differences. <clears throat> yeah. Actually, it, then, then if you have one factor in the equation, you can then calculate the other. Yeah, because using the Fick principle again, uh, <clears throat> you can substitute the cerebral blood flow from the inert gas, and then you measure an arteriovenous oxygen difference, and the product of the blood flow and the oxygen difference gives you one the oxygen consumption of the brain. And, but these are, these are figures for the whole brain at that time. That's right. That was a quite a remarkable achievement for, because basically what you're doing is measuring something that normally the brain doesn't use, and from that, gaining information about very important things that the brain uses. <laughs> it's, uh, it's this kind of theme that I've tried to follow, you know, throughout when reading your work, that uh, you began by studying what is a very fundamental technique to get at uh, uh, the, the energy consumption of the brain, fundamentally, because that's what you're doing. And yet it has gone into tr uh, many ramifications from that. Um, now, how did you build on that, uh, the initial models that you used to get at the, uh, the energy consumption of the brain, where you, you s your ideas were based on the work of uh, Krogh and also Bohr, I think. And how did you go from the, that step? How did you come into that uh, understanding? To move from from the total circulation yeah. and metabolism to, regional. to regional. regional. <coughs> that was, of course, a, a very important problem, very important step. The first, <coughs> one of the first applications, one of the first clinical applications that we, that we <coughs> decided to examine, the, uh, uh, that we, that we, in which we decided to use the nitrous oxide technique, was an examination of schizophrenia. And the reason for that is an interesting one. Uh, that the, work, the development of the nitrous oxide technique took place on, with the help of a, of a grant from the Scottish Rite program in dementia precox. 
And since it was called the Mentor Precox, you have an idea of how old it was. Mm -hmm. That program was started by the 33rd degree Masons uh, in, the, in the early 30s. And uh, since, the, since the donors never asked us what the cerebral circulation had to do with schizophrenia or with dementia precox. I felt that I was grateful to them because they, they gave such great scientific freedom to the people who got the grants, uh, enabling them to do basic research. That uh, I felt that now that we had such a technique, it would be, it would be very important and, and very gratifying to apply it to schizophrenia. And as a matter of fact, there was a hypothesis at that time that was promulgated that schizophrenia was the result of a deficiency of oxygen supply to the brain. So that made it really almost mandatory that one having such a technique should apply it to this important problem. And so we began a collaboration with Fritz Freihan at the Delaware State Hospital and we studied schizophrenia and measured the oxygen consumption. And, and we discovered measuring the, these functions in, in a group of severely ill schizophrenics, we discovered that they had a blood flow and an oxygen consumption through their whole brain, which was not significantly different from that of normal young men, which permitted me to conclude that it takes as much oxygen to think an irrational thought as it does to think a rational thought. And that was not, that's not really unexpected if one, if one is really very wise and open-minded because a radio does not use more energy uh, when it's listening to a, a, a profound speech by a national leader than when it's listening to the work of a comedian or even to the to, to listening to static. Mm -hmm. And so it isn't so much the energy involved as it is the way in which the energy is, is parceled out and in which it's distributed and uh, its use is distributed in the brain. So the next item on my agenda was how to measure the, the blood flow and the oxygen consumption and the metabolism of individual small regions of, of brain because it was still possible that there were changes in the brain, but that these brain changes were limited to certain regions which would be swamped out if one measured the total circulation. Well, um, again, I spent uh, considerable time developing the, the principles of inert gas exchange between the brain capillaries and brain tissue uh, and also exchange at the lung and so on. And I wrote a review for pharmacologic reviews on, on, on essentially that title, the exchange, the, the theory and applications of the exchange of inert gas at the lungs and tissues. And in the course of that, I, having reviewed the literature up to that point, I developed an equation which indicated that the, that the blood flow uh, through any particular re homogeneous region of the brain would be a function of the history of the arterial concentration of a tracer, a diffusible inert tracer, uh, and the uh, diffusion coefficient of that tracer in the brain, and the solubility of it in the brain and the blood flow. And given that one could measure the solubility and, and the diffusion, and if the diffusion coefficient were high enough in the brain so that diffusion was not a limiting factor, one could then calculate the regional blood flow from measurement of the tissue concentration. And how was one to measure the tissue concentration? Well. There are ways of measuring the concentration in the tissue, even though one couldn't measure the concentration in the, in the individual veins leaving, and that is what one could calculate from the tissue. Um, I didn't do anything with this theory uh, 
uh, with this equation because in 1951, I came to the, when, which was just about the time that that review was published, uh, I came to Bethesda at the invitation of, of Dr. Felix, who was the first director of the Mental Health Institute, uh, who came and, and twisted my arm to come down to Bethesda and to become the scientific director of this great institute that he was building here. He talked about it as, 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 as building the greatest research program in the brain and behavior that the world has ever seen. And although I, I started out very reluctant to work for the government, when I came down to Bethesda, met some of the people in his new institute, and met some of the other scientific directors, I became uh, sufficiently stimulated and challenged that I came down. And in 1951, I came to Bethesda as the scientific director of both the Mental Health Institute and the Neurology Institute, which sprang out of the Mental Health Institute like Eve springing out of Adam's rib. Uh, so I, I had to put research aside for a couple of years while I recruited the people to staff the intramural program of the Mental Health Institute. In 1955, a young postdoctoral fellow who was working with Wade Marshall here in Bethesda in, 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 the, in this intramural program, I had already appointed Wade Marshall as head of neurophysiology. Uh, by the name of Landau, Bill Landau, came to see me uh, with, the, I, with the, the thought that he would like to study the regional circulation of the brain. And uh, after a couple of attempts with uh, injecting uh, an inert gas in, in saline into the brain, which was another application of this principle, I finally bit the bullet and suggested, you know, I developed an equation in 1951 that would permit us to do this. And all we have to do is measure the, the distribution of an inert gas in the brain. And it didn't take long to decide that if we had a radioactive inert gas, by autoradiography, we could measure its concentration in various structures of the brain. And that would give us the main the main measurement that we needed in order to calculate the cerebral blood flow. And that's, that's exactly what we did. We were joined by Dr. Sokoloff, mm -hmm. who was uh, already in Bethesda uh, in the laboratory of cerebral metabolism. And we were joined by another postdoctoral uh, uh, as research associate in, uh, in, in, neuro in the Neurology Institute who was Lewis Rowland. Both, both Landau and Rowland became distinguished professors of neurology eventually. And, and um, by Walter Freigang, who was working with Wade Marshall at that time. And, um, and we developed a radioactive inert gas uh, labeled with iodine, with radioactive iodine. And uh, we, didn't, we didn't have access to a fancy uh, uh, microtome that would slice the brain in, in, in the precise kinds of slices that we needed. So uh, what we did was to buy a bandsaw from Sears Roebuck, and we cut the brain into sections with the bandsaw. And uh, this was all done after freezing the head in liquid nitrogen. And, uh, and then we had to make the autoradiogram, since this was a gas which would which would volatilize uh, uh, and disperse a at room temperatures. We had to make the autoradiograms in dry ice. And eventually we got these autoradiograms and, and, and they worked out beautifully. We, we could measure from the density of the radiogram, we could, we could measure the concentration in the brain and from that calculate the blood flow in 28 structures of the brain. And the first publication on that well, after an abstract, which I gave at the International Physiologic Congress in Montreal, the first publication was a publication by Bill Landau and the rest of us, yeah. uh, 
in the uh, transactions of the American uh, College of... That was in the late uh, 50s, wasn't it? That uh, was 55. 55, that's right. Yeah. right. And after that, uh, we took some time to improve on the technique uh, with Martin Rivich, who joined the laboratory as a postdoc uh, uh, some uh, about that time. Uh, we used uh, a radioactive antipyrene, C14 antipyrene, uh, which was a, a solid and didn't, and didn't volatilize, and so we didn't have to use uh, uh, liquid nitrogen and, and, uh, and dry ice, but the brain could be frozen and cut in a, in a cryostat instead of being cut with a bandsaw. And uh, antipyrene wasn't ideal because antipyrene is not completely diffusible through the brain. And Dr. Sokoloff later improved on that by using iodo antipyrene labeled with C14. And iodo antipyrene is lipid soluble and does diffuse very rapidly through the brain. And that then became the, the standard technique for regional blood flow uh, in, in the brain of animals, because one had to kill the animal, uh, sacrifice uh, the, the brain, section it, and so forth. Uh, it wasn't until the, a few years later, in 1961, actually, that Niels Lassen and David Ingvar applied these equations and this general technique to the human brain which they did using gamma-emitting isotopes and collimated uh, detectors. And they did a great deal of work on, on the rough regional circulation of the brain. But their studies were rather invasive. That, it, they, they were able to do them during uh, uh, neurosurgical operations in which the internal jugular was, ex internal carotid was exposed and where they could inject the radioactive tracer directly into the internal carotid, which would then distribute through the brain. Uh, when the positron emission tomography was elaborated uh, and the first PET scanner was developed, it then became possible to apply the same equations to measurement of regional blood flow in human brain. And uh, it was... Uh, Mark Reichel at Washington University and his group, which uh, applied these equations in the, what he called the autoradiographic technique uh, to the human brain. And from there, he has gone on, and other people have, to measure regional circulation in the human brain. And his most recent work is very fascinating. He's used this to study cognitive function in the human brain. Uh, the advantage of the cerebral blood flow is that it is a very rapid measure of functional activity uh, because one can make these measurements uh, sequentially over a period of a minute or, or, or two, uh, making several of them. The further development in this area, of course, was Dr. Sokoloff's. Um, Dr. Sokoloff, right after he had developed the iodo antipyrene technique for regional blood flow, uh, went on to study regional metabolism, and he developed the uh, <clears throat> deoxyglucose tracer as a means of studying glucose uptake in the brain, and, and, and developed a technique with remarkable resolution and, and accuracy for measuring regional metabolism in the brain. It, that's, um, it's interesting that the, all the genesis of this work, which was so fundamental, began in a uh, laboratory which was actually combining the mental health and the neurological institute uh, at a time. And as you said, the uh, uh, neurological institute split off in, uh, uh, from uh, that original concept of a unified scientific uh, directorate. Um, some people would say that, and I, I'm asking this question, which is a slight digression from your work, but your work has also included administration and organization of research efforts. And some people have said that uh, one of the problems of much of the uh, work being done in the brain and mind is that there is this continuing dichotomy between those who are interested in more uh, 
mental kind of applications and the more brain applications. And very often, the connection, which is obviously there, and it, since it's the same system, is forgotten. Uh, how do you think that could be resolved? Are the present systems adequate to deal with it? Or do we need new structures to do this kind of connecting work between what are, is appearing to be different interests and different uh, sub-disciplines? Well, <clears throat> there is a great deal <clears throat> of overlap between, the, between neurology and psychiatry. And of course, even more overlap in terms of the fundamental neural mechanisms which are involved in behavior, mentation, and, and, and uh, the functions that neurology deals with. Uh, and in those areas, of course, one, there is a, there is a, 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 a need for interaction and, and, and co collaboration. However, in many of the areas that psychiatry deals with, one is dealing with not so much the machinery of the brain as with the information which the brain is storing. It's like the difference between the hardware of a computer and the information which the computer is storing. Now, one needs to know a great deal about the hardware in order to build a computer, in order to repair a computer, but one doesn't really need to know the hardware as well if one is going to deal simply with the information. And a lot of what psychiatry deals with has to do with the way information is channeled in the brain and what is done with the information and the significance of the information. I've often used the analogy of the difference between a Republican and a Democrat. Now, certainly, every, every movement, every, every <laughs> mental function, every aspect of behavior is, is mediated by the nervous system so that there, there must be a, a neuronal basis for uh, every action that we take and, and moving the lever in a voting machine to, uh, of the Republican or of the Democratic candidate uh, must also be governed by the neural circuits of the brain. But the chance of finding, discovering those circuits and the differences between them are very difficult. On the other hand, one can examine the differences between Republicans and Democrats in terms of a lot of sociological and, and, and psychological uh, distinctions so that uh, it would be foolhardy for a biochemist or a neurophysiologist to study the brain to try to, deter to try to determine such a difference. Now, if schizophrenia is like the difference, is like being a Republican or being a Democrat, then of course uh, uh, there's not much likelihood that we're going to come up with the fundamental basis for schizophrenia in studying the nervous system. But I've had a, 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 a conviction for a long time that schizophrenia is not that, that schizophrenia is a disease of the brain and not of the information which is stored in the brain. I was going to say that because you have worked in the genetics of schizophrenia also, that study you did in uh, Denmark with the uh, Danish scientists is a very landmark study in the genetics of schizophrenia. Uh, and that would support your contention that this, there is a very strong genetic bias and therefore doesn't this lead, however, to a conclusion which in a sense opposes what you've just said about uh, uh, the information being studied separately? Because if you have a system where the, the structure itself, the hardware as it were, is, is uniquely determined to work in a certain way and not another way, then there would be a linkage from the mechanistic level to the informational level or the sociological level. Yes, yes. If, if schizophrenia is truly a a defect in the hardware of the brain, then there is, then there would be an explanation from studying the hardware of why the schizophrenic's mental processes are different from that of a normal individual. That, that's certainly true. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, I don't think one would get at that by studying the mental processes uh, entirely. One, in order to get to the fundamental problem that one might be a problem that might be amenable to treatment, 
one would have to know what the, what the disturbance was in the machinery what, and fix, fix the hardware and the information flow and information processing would take care of itself. Now it is true that, that the adaptation of the schizophrenic, the intensity of the symptoms, his response to his family and so on, may to a very large extent be modified and modulated by uh, his in personal interactions and, and the mental states and the mental processing of information. But uh, the evidence that it is caused by these things is not, is not as good as the evidence that there are, there, there are biological factors operating that differentiate it. And I think one of the most important bits of this evidence is the evidence that genetic factors operate. Now, not exclusively, as you indicated, yeah. mm -hmm. genetic factors play a role in schizophrenia, but they don't play the, the entire role. This gets into the tangled problem of upward versus downward causation. And maybe we leave that till the end because that gets into a bit of speculation. As, are the rules, the laws that we seek to discover are always fundamental laws, but there may be separate laws at higher levels, which also then are causal and also causing downstream effects. So well, we as yet don't know about those very well. But that's an important issue which actually comes out of your work also that I want to get into. Uh, I thought I'd briefly go over some of the, uh, the contributions you've made uh, uh, which I had not realized until I recently re again reviewed your work, that a lot of your work uh, confirmed the uh, very significant differences between the oxygen effect and carbon dioxide effect on the cerebral circulation, which for uh, neurosurgery is a very, very fundamental, as you know, because we, we have tried for years to control brain swelling, and this is still the best method to control brain swelling <laughs> by just regulating the homeostasis of oxygen. Uh, how did you get the clue to this and the clue to the pH regulation? that there was a role in this to play on the, on the pH? Once the method was developed, uh, the first thing we wanted to do was to study the normal values, and we, we were able to, to uh, use normal volunteers at the uh, University of Pennsylvania. These were, the war was, was in progress at that time, and these were conscientious objectors who uh, agreed to participate in medical research as their contribution to the war effort rather than carry arms. And uh, <clears throat> so we studied these, uh, these uh, uh, fine young men and uh, got the first values for regional, for <laughs> got the first values for total blood flow and total, total oxygen consumption in them. <clears throat> the next step <clears throat> was the obvious step of the effect of, of the respiratory gases because there had been animal studies that indicated that carbon dioxide was an important vasodilator and oxygen uh, played a role in regulating the uh, cerebral blood flow. And there had even been uh, some interesting human studies where uh, Lennox and Gibbs, for example, in Boston had measured simply the arteriovenous oxygen difference and with CO2 breathing, the arteriovenous difference diminishes. And with hyperventilation, it increases, from which they inferred that blood flow was rapid during carbon dioxide inhalation and slowed during hyperventilation. A reasonable conclusion, but that depended upon their assuming that the metabolism was not affecting the arteriovenous difference. Interestingly enough, around the same time, <coughs> Harold Himwich was studying the metabolism of the brain and not the blood flow, and he used the arteriovenous oxygen difference, and from changes in the arteriovenous oxygen difference deduced changes in the metabolism of the brain. Now, interestingly enough, these gentlemen <clears throat> usually came up with a conclusion which was subsequently supported because they were wise enough to choose those conditions in which the metabolism did remain constant, to use the AV difference for blood flow, and him which was wise enough to use conditions in which, in which the blood flow remained constant to use the AV difference for metabolism. When CO2 dilates blood vessels, this has been a problem which has been common in, in, in physiology. 
Uh, uh, one doesn't know whether it's the direct action of the CO2 or whether it's the change in the pH which the CO2 induces. Uh, we didn't know that either, but <clears throat> we, among the clinical conditions we studied was diabetic acidosis. And we found that in diabetic acidosis, there was a, a very good correlation between the pH of the arterial blood and cerebral blood flow. So that suggested, it didn't prove, that suggested that hydrogen ion was playing an important role. But I would not argue that, that we made a very important contribution to that concept. It, it, yes, it did raise the issue, which then people have been very attentive to since then, yeah. Um, the other um, in, interesting contribution, I think, was the, the, the fact that you showed by your studies that the sleep is not associated with a decreased oxygen consumption in the brain. I think that was very, a very key contribution with Mangold, I think, was involved in that study. And so therefore, it's not a, the usual thought before that was sleep is a depression. Everything goes sinking down. And, um, uh, and then the studies in aging, which showed that uh, it, it is an increasing uh, consumption in the early fetal stages because you study development until you get to the aging process when again there is a surprisingly maintenance of the flow. This was rather contradictory. So did you find it as surprising as uh, at that time or were you, did you have some mm -hmm. hypothesis to guide you at yes, that time? Yes, as a matter of fact, the, the history of that is, is uh, a little more complicated than that. The, <clears throat> the, the sleep studies I thought were very interesting and very surprising. Uh, Rennie Mangold was a postdoc and, and we decided uh, Sokolov and uh, others in the laboratory and I decided to work with Mangold, get, get Mangold to, to take the lead in doing some studies on sleep. And uh, <clears throat> we were surprised that, the, that in sleep the metabolism of the brain, the blood flow of the brain was relatively uh, normal uh, because, as you indicate, the, the, the current opinion uh, current consensus was that the brain was asleep in sleep. And uh, I remember, <clears throat> I remember Sherrington's poetic description of the waking brain, yes. where, where a light goes on here and the light goes on there, and then there's a string of lights, and presently the whole, the whole city is ablaze uh, with lights. Uh, <clears throat> therefore, we expected that in sleep we would get a reduction as we had found in coma. Yeah. In coma, there is a 50% reduction in the oxygen consumption of the brain. Well, <clears throat> it's surprising that in sleep that didn't happen. And that was later confirmed when Ed Everts, using single electrode recording, demonstrated that, that in the brain and in sleep, certain neurons may become quiescent, other neurons may become overstimulated. And in REM sleep, uh, the brain is actually much more active. Now, we did not study REM sleep at that time. Most of our subjects were in, in slow wave sleep. <coughs> uh, later, with Marty Rivich and using regional blood flow measurement, it was possible to study REM sleep in cats. And there, uh, <coughs> we found that the, that the blood flow uh, in the brain was elevated by about 90% uh, in, in REM sleep throughout the brain. The story with aging is, is rather complicated. Uh, we hadn't studied aging ourselves at that time, but uh, having been asked to present a paper at a, at a conference on aging, uh, I reviewed the literature, uh, which by that time had accumulated uh, a number of observations on cerebral blood flow by other workers using the nitrous oxide technique. And uh, these studies had included individuals and pa uh, patients and, and normal volunteers of various ages. When I plotted the mean cerebral blood flow in each study against the mean age of the subjects in each study, a very nice negative correlation appeared. The the blood flow diminishing and the oxygen consumption diminishing as the age increased. And that's what I reported. In a little while, we realized that that, that, that was 
a, an artifact of the way in which these populations were selected. Uh, as one studies an, a population of, of higher and higher age, one includes in that population more and more people with cerebrovascular disease or other disorders which would, uh, which would embarrass the cerebral circulation. And so that what one should really do was to study longitudinal, longitudinally or study selected populations who are free of, of, of neurologic and cardiovascular disorder. At the NIMH, we were able to recruit elderly individuals uh, from retirement homes who were willing to come to Washington and participate in research. And many of these individuals were extremely uh, uh, alert and, and, uh, and mentally, mentally active. And, uh, and so we were able to divide the group into those patients or subjects who were really uh, completely normal, some who showed some impairment, and then we went to St. Elizabeth's Hospital and studied people with senile dementia. dementia. What we found there was <clears throat> that the, the elderly individuals, even 70 and 80 years old, who were mentally alert, had blood flow and metabolism of the brain, which was not significantly different from that of normal young men. So that our conclusion was that aging in itself does not necessarily diminish the blood flow to the brain, except insofar as it is associated with cerebrovascular disorder. Um, as a matter of fact, we also thought, or I also thought at that time, that, that senile dementia was largely the result of cerebrovascular disease. That, and that's sort of obvious. The, the, the arteries become, become calcified. They're atherosclerotic. The, there's an increased resistance to the flow of blood. The blood flow goes down. Metabolism, oxygen delivery would go down. So truth of the matter is, of course, that, that is only, that's a cause of only one type of senile dementia. The, the major senile dementias, like those of Alzheimer's disorder, are not, are, may be associated with a reduced cerebral blood flow, but that is a secondary, secondary. phenomenon. Exactly. Right. This, this uh, whole issue is very important because it leads into what I think is the, the last subject we want to get to, uh, and that is that uh, both your uh, endeavors, the first one where you studied the metabolism of the whole brain, the energy use of the whole brain, and the regional flow studies, uh, initially, well, definitely with the first set of studies, it suggested that when there are activations in the brain, for example, in doing mental arithmetic or um, with sleep, or, or in toxic psychosis, and when the brain is resting or not doing anything, that the energy consumption did not change it in, in, in effect. So the, the concept was regional redistribution, and indeed when regional studies began, again based on your work, this is indeed what was found, a lot of regional distribution. But now with the latest regional studies, it, look, it looks as if this is being confirmed except for one study from Sweden which suggests at the most an increase of 10%, which is uh, a very small increase during uh, visual spatial activation tasks of the brain. And this raises the interesting uh, conclusion because uh, when I was reading your, one, your Harvey lecture, I think it was, in which you stated the biological roots of mental illness, um, you felt that um, this, the fact that the total energy utilization does not change when one is doing mental work or not very to a great extent, unlike any other machine in the universe, <laughs> uh, that it may be on how the energy is directed by the switches. Now, if one says that, what, what one is saying is that the changes in the functional state of the brain is brought about without significant measurable change in energy, could it, uh, and, and therefore this could be caused by how the energy is used, but the energy use is directed by the neural network itself. So in effect, one is saying that the neural networks or the information processing process is controlling the hardware. And it gets into this whole issue of although the techniques that you have developed uh, have shown that we can measure the quantities of the brain's work, what the brain is working at, uh, we are still not getting at the qualitative aspect of it. Is there a way that one could get into this? And would you like to comment, first of all, on the first issue, 
is this a tautologous situation we're stuck in or do we, can we develop it further by quantitative analysis or is there a newer technique that will have to get at the qualitative aspect of information? Well, I think that the regional blood flow and regional metabolism studies uh, are capable of measuring just that, regional blood flow, regional metabolism. And there is a great deal of evidence that regional glucose metabolism and regional blood flow are very closely associated with functional activity. The more neurons are active, the greater would be the metabolism in that region and the greater would be the blood flow. Now, that's about as far as we can get. Uh, most of the time where the primary difficulty <coughs> is in the machinery, uh, one sees these, uh, these, these observe, one makes these observations and one can infer that the mental changes or the behavioral changes are secondary to these, to these material changes. On the other hand, uh, there are many examples where the psychological phenomena precede the neural phenomena. Uh, when someone presents me with a horrible, horrible sight, when, when someone calls me <laughs> a name that I dislike, I become angry, and my anger is not caused by what's going on in my brain, but my anger, clearly, that psychological presentation, which is certainly a psychological phenomenon, has elicited a neural response. And so, as you say, the network in that case, the psychological input has gone into the neural network, the neural network has altered the metabolism and altered the changes in order to somehow adapt or even in order to perceive what is going on. So that we have to recognize that there is no simple, single answer. We cannot say that the machinery of the brain determines mental state and determines behavior because there are many times when mental state and the perceptions of the mind uh, determine the function of the neural network and the function of the, of the uh, uh, machinery of the brain. A key question uh, I think that every scientist working with the brain and mind has is that uh, current theories uh, are seeking to attempt uh, to, underst to understand all the data that we have now used primarily on techniques of localizing uh, the functions of the brain in, in smaller and smaller areas uh, and attempting to reduce this to the smallest possible units in other words, a reductive approach. Uh, this would certainly explain upward causation. The question is, can we, by following such techniques, uh, uh, develop a full theory of the brain and mind uh, as a unified system, which it is? Or uh, if this fails, uh, can we, we, do we have to develop a different set of techniques and ways of approaching scientifically the problem of downward causation, which, uh, as you have just stated, uh, certainly exists when um, an emotional situation affects our neural processes. Um, I'd like your thoughts on these, these two questions. The, uh, the techniques that we've been talking about for regional metabolism and regional blood flow uh, are not going to give us the answer to the question that you raised, but they are going to give us material, further material on which we can base speculation and perhaps some heuristic hypotheses. Um, <clears throat> what we will find and are finding with regional studies of metabolism and blood flow is that there is an association between an increase, let us say, in blood flow and stimulation of the brain. And this stimulation could be a purely physical thing like, like uh, flashing light on the retina and, and observing changes in the visual cortex, but it could also be a psychological stimulation. And there are many, there are many studies and many observations which have been made with these PET techniques, which show that regional areas of the brain respond to psychological stimuli and even interpersonal stimuli uh, with changes in the blood flow and the metabolism. So these studies will make it very clear that there is a downward 
regulation of blood flow and metabolism, as, as well as an upward regulation of thought and feeling and behavior from these areas. But I don't think they're going to tell us the precise mechanisms in which psychological stimuli affect the blood flow of the brain or affect ultimately affect behavior and emotion. But I think there is one area of, of, the, of the brain where we, may, where we may see the effect of a psychological process on a neural system. And that is the area in which memory takes place. Memory must involve alterations in the patterns of neural activity, alterations in the, in the resistance at various synapses in order to permit the establishment of a new pattern which can then remain in the brain as a change in structure or in function. Uh, and yet the, this, this is produced by a psychological input. <clears throat> now, something is taking place at the synapses when we have a psychological input. And we're beginning to understand a little bit about these changes. We're beginning to understand that affect, for example, may regulate the, uh, the long-term resistance of certain synap synaptic junctions. Uh, and that affect may be involved in the establishment of a new memory. As we understand that process even further, it is possible that we will be able to say precisely what happens when a new psychological input develops a trace in the brain uh, that causes that al an alteration in subsequent behavior. We will understand that. Uh, and when we understand that, we will then be able to say, here is an example of downward uh, uh, determination. The psychological event has altered these particular synapses, and these particular synapses have created a trace in the brain which can be uh, re reawakened, <clears throat> reutilized to produce a change in, in thought, which is memory or in behavior. And uh, I'm convinced, of course, as you are, that there is a downward determination of the nervous system, just as there is an upward determination of behavior and mental state uh, from the nervous system. And I think the answer is not to, <laughs> not to close one's mind. Exactly. <laughs> the brain is far more complicated yeah. than, than, than any single hypothesis is going to explain. Yes, I think simplistic ideas always had a hierarchy, and somehow the hier hierarchy worked in one way. Exactly. And it's more of a process. Exactly. And uh, um, I think um, that is probably a good summary of really the, the whole situation, uh, where we are at the, at the present time. Is there any final word that you would like to give on your own speculation for brain theory? <coughs> well, <coughs> I think you've, you've, you've stated that that is a, as good a summary of of uh, my theory of the brain, uh, we have to make a distinction between theories that may explain behavior and emotion and thought in terms of the biology of the brain, regardless of whether one is determining the other. Or, but we also have to come to grips with consciousness, because all of what we have been talking about before could take place in an unconscious automaton of, of fantastic complexity, but nevertheless an automaton. That's exactly so. And consciousness is a problem that I, although I have thought about for many, many years, I have not satisfactorily explained to myself in terms of the machinery of the brain. And I must say that I remain a dualist. I think if one can reduce the whole universe to two, to two entities, that's not bad. And I don't feel any great urge to reduce the whole universe to one entity, whether it be mind or matter. It's, uh, I, would I would just uh, uh, like to suggest a final speculation. If 
uh, as it suggests from the anatomy, that the structures in the brain that deal with the memory are also the structures that deal with affect. It's the same structures, coincidentally. Therefore, that this may be a unifying factor because the emotions give us the quality of our thoughts. Uh, when we measure thoughts, we're measuring the quantitative aspects. But as you said, it's not the quantitative aspect that gets at the thought, really. It's the consciousness, which is the, the qualitative feeling, as it were, what philosophers call the, the qualia, or the, uh, uh, the, the thing as it is. Well, I think Kant referred to it as that way. Maybe by studying the affect and the mechanisms that we might be able to unify this, if we could somehow quantify it. Would that be possible? Well, <clears throat> I would agree with you very strongly that affect is terribly important in governing the laying down of memories. And uh, as a matter of fact, we are seeing that. In, there, have been, there were speculations that I, that I wrote about in, 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 in 1970 about how, how affect could help in the consolidation of memory uh, by the release of neurotransmitters and the changes that took place at synapses, magnesium and calcium changes and so forth. Uh, <clears throat> Eric Kandel has actually demonstrated that there is a serotonin input to some simple neural models which is determined by what one might call an affective state which does play a role in in associative memory. That I think we will learn a great deal about. How affect affects consciousness, I think, is a, is a problem which I don't really see our being able to, to, to address. It is possible that, let us say, if we start with a change in affect, a drug which will produce euphoria obviously changes the conscious state so that we know that there is an upward determination a, a, drugs can produce changes in consciousness as a matter of fact an inhalation of ether will change consciousness yeah, exactly. so that we we know that, that that these two these two entities are not are not mutually exclusive and independent they have to relate to each other but just as we know that consciousness depends upon the machinery of the brain, we also have to recognize that the machinery of the brain, its, its present status and what, how it will be changed in the future depends upon our conscious state. How that is brought about, I unfortunately cannot address, but there is no doubt in my mind that, that there is a two-way street and that there is a great deal of interaction between them. Thank you very much, Dr. Ketty. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very much, Dr. Amaya.